So we're now taking notes on unit six, and this is gonna be about antiderivatives, which are the opposite of derivatives. And so kind of the first part of calculus was all about derivatives. And then this last part of calculus is all gonna be about antiderivatives, kind of the opposite of derivatives. And so when we kind of start this off, uh, we're gonna ask ourselves if we had to explain to someone how to find the derivative of a function, what would we, what would we do in a polynomial function? So, you know, like something like x cubed plus x squared. And so step one would have been that we multiply the exponent by the coefficient. If you want to add on, we could say for each term, right? If there are more than one terms, we do this for each term. And then step two was we subtract the exponent by one. Okay, and so if we wanted to undo that, right, if we wanted to undo that, we would need to go in reverse order. So for an antiderivative, that's kind of what we're doing is we're going in reverse order. So we're going to start off, instead of by subtracting one, if we reverse this, we're going to add one. And then kind of undoing this in reverse order instead of multiplying by the exponent, we're gonna divide the coefficient by that new exponent, right? Because we're going in reverse order. So we're using the new exponent. And so this'll be kind of our, essentially our power rule, our, you know, our general rule for finding the antiderivatives. So our symbol for an antiderivative, remember how we had a few symbols for derivatives, right? Like for derivatives, we had d dx, we had f prime of x, and we had y prime, right? For antiderivatives, there's really only one symbol, and it looks like this guy kind of looks like a big S, and it's called an integral symbol. So this symbol, when you see this, you know, you can read as the integral. So an integral means antiderivative. They're kind of the same word. So we would read this by saying the integral of f of x. So when finding the antiderivative of a function, you are finding a function of which f of x is the first derivative. And this will enable us, if given f prime or f double prime, to go back and to find f. Um, so kind of, the question though is if f prime of x, if the integral of f prime of x equals f of x, what problem do you foresee? And this is kind of an advanced thing to, to think of in your head, but we'll kind of do it with a graph. And so we'll kind of show that is if we kind of think about uh, when we take the derivative of a function, right? If we kind of think about, you know, if we had say, x squared plus two, like y equals x squared plus two, then y prime would be two x. But if we had y equals, say, x squared minus six, y prime would be two x. If we had y equals even x squared plus a thousand, y prime would be two x. So what happens is because our constant Right, when we take the derivative, our constant kind of disappears. When we go backwards and we take the integral, right, when we go backwards, we don't know what that constant is. And so that's kind of an issue is we don't know what that constant is. And so when we can't fully determine f of x without a little bit more information. So what we'll kind of say is although the integral of f prime of x dx should be f of x. But 
there is no way of knowing if there is a constant. We'll say if f of x has a constant term. So therefore, we write that the integral of f prime of x dx equals f of x plus c. So you can kind of get rid of that guy if you want to, and we add on this plus c. So we're always, always, always going to add plus c whenever we do an antiderivative. Okay, uh, later on when we like plug in numbers, we don't have to do plus c once we have numbers. But otherwise, we always, always, always want to add on that plus c. Okay, that's going to be very, very important. So we're going to do a few of these, and we always want to get them first into polynomial form. Just like when we were taking derivatives with the power rule, we want to first get them into polynomial form if they're not. So the first one is, so we're just going to go one term at a time. So for 3x squared, we're going to kind of, remember, we're going to leave the 3. And then we're going to just do x. Now we're going to add 1. So x to the third power. And then over 3. Then for 2, this was x to the first power. So if we add on 1, that's going to be x to the second power over 2. And for 3, this is a little bit weird. But we're kind of trying to undo this. So if you think in your head, what would be the derivative? What derivative would give, or what function would give a derivative of three? Right, like if I had y equals something, what would be the derivative? You know, when the what would y be when the derivative was three? And that's three x, right? If we had three x, the derivative would be three. And so the reason that this still follows the pattern, you don't have to write this in, but technically, when you have three there, it's x to the zeroth power. Right, 3x to the 0th power is the same as 3. So if you had 3x to the 0th power, when you add 1 and then divide by 1, you get 3x. Uh, now, you don't have to really remember that. What we can just kind of remember as a rule, if you want to, you can put this you know, kind of off on the side, is the integral of a constant, like of a number, dx, will be equal to that number times x and then always plus c. So when you take the integral of a number, you just kind of add on an x to the number. Okay, so then at the end, we always need to do plus c. Now we can go ahead and simplify this a little bit, so clean it up. Uh, the threes will cancel, the twos will cancel, and we get x cubed plus x squared plus 3x plus c. And we just don't know what that constant is. It could be zero, it could be four, it could be any constant number. All right, our next one, again, we want this in polynomial form. So we learned uh, quite a few chapters ago that if you have a numerator, you're adding on the numerator, you can split up the numerator uh, for a fraction. So we can kind of write this as the integral of x cubed over x plus 2x over x minus 4 over x. And... If you have more than one term for the integral, you you know it's it's good practice to put a parentheses around all of those terms and then the dx. So in when we're reading this, this is the dx is always kind of the ending. So this symbol is the integral, it's the start of our antiderivative. And then this dx is kind of, you know, we're taking the integral with respect to x. And it ends our interval, our integral, right? So this is kind of our starting point and our ending point for what we're doing the antiderivative of. So now we can go ahead and simplify this. X cubed divided by X becomes X squared. All right, we cancel out one of them. X over X, those cancel, so X squared plus 2. And minus this one, we want to rewrite it in polynomial form. So we're going to write this as 4X to the negative first power. And now we can go ahead and we can apply the... Uh, antiderivative rule, so we're going to add 1 to each term and divide. So this becomes x cubed over 3 
Plus, remember for uh, this guy, when we add one, there was no x, so we just add on an x. And then this next one is a little bit tricky. Okay, this next one is a little bit tricky. If I added one, I would get minus 4x to the zeroth power over zero, which we know is undefined, right? But there's actually a special rule here. And this is kind of an interesting one. And so this was, you know, kind of our first rule that we thought about. The second rule that we're gonna be thinking about is the ln of x, right? If we kind of go back and we remember, don't write this part down, but in green, if we remember that, you know, if we had y equals ln of x, y prime was one over x. So if we're gonna go backwards, right, the rule that we wanna write down is the integral of one over x dx will always give us back ln of x plus c. Okay. We can also do the same thing with uh, e to the x. So for e to the x, if we had y equals e to the x, y prime would be e to the x, it would be itself. So if we take the integral of e to the x, then we get back e to the x plus c. So the integral of e to the x is e to the x. This brings me to like the most lame math joke that I know, which is that we had pi and ln of x and sine of x and cosine of x, they all were thrown a party. And they had this big math party, all of the functions were there. And pi noticed off in the corner that e to the x was crying. He's kind of sobbing just in the corner by himself. And so pi goes up to him and he says, hey, hey, e to the x, why don't you integrate into our party? And e to the x cries even more because it wouldn't even make a difference. So if you got that math joke, I'm sorry, but uh, you can you can talk to me about it in class. So anyways, uh, what we can kind of do here is when we see anything, you know, basically four over x or x to the negative one power, right? Whenever we just have a number over x, that becomes, the integral becomes ln of x. So the four stays there, but then ln of x. So the integral of one over x is ln of x. The integral of like five over x would be five ln of x. Now don't forget your minus sign that was before. And then also don't forget the plus c. So that's kind of the process of taking a little bit more complicated antiderivative. Okay, this next one is not so complicated, but we need to get it in polynomial form first. So we're just gonna foil it out and then we can do our antiderivative rule. So we'll get two x squared minus three x plus four x minus six. I'm gonna put that parentheses around and then dx. We'll combine like terms, make it a little bit easier. So the integral of two x squared plus x minus six dx. And then this becomes two times x squared over three plus x squared over two minus six x plus three. And that's our answer. I'll just kind of rewrite this as two thirds x squared plus one half x squared minus six x. Oops, I said plus three, it's plus c. Plus c. Okay, and you could write it this way. You also could have written it as 2x squared over 3 plus x squared over 2 minus 6x plus c. That would have been the same thing. So just kind of remember that, that with fractions, you can either write the 2 thirds off to the side, or you can move the x squared up into the numerator. Okay, uh, this last one, again, we want polynomial form. So I'm going to rewrite this as 2x to the negative 1 half power. Right, so anytime we have uh, an x in the denominator that isn't just one over x, right? If it's one over x, it's gonna be ln of x. But this wasn't just x, right? This was like the integral of two over x to the half power. We're always going to move that x up to the numerator with a negative to get into polynomial form. So now we're just kind of applying that, that antiderivative rule where we add one and then divide. 
So I'm going to put my two off to the side. And when I add one, this is very similar to fractions before. Remember how with the, the earlier fractions, I would tell you guys to subtract the denominator from the numerator. Well, this time you're going to add the denominator to the numerator is the shortcut, right? Because basically negative one half plus one, when we lollipop the one, we're going to multiply by the denominator. So the shortcut is you're always adding on the denominator, right? Negative one plus two, that gives positive one half. So this is going to be x to the positive one half, and then we divide by one half, and always plus c. When you divide by a fraction, that flips. So this is two times two times x to the one half plus c. So we get four square root of x plus c. So again, the shortcut, I'm going to write divided by one half here, but you can kind of remember that whenever you're dividing by a fraction, you can just flip it. You can just take the reciprocal. So a lot of people actually jump straight to this step where they just immediately flip that one half to be two over one. Okay. So we learned about essentially our basic, you know, rule for integration. Then we also learned about kind of that constant rule. We learned about the integral of one over X and we learned about the integral of E to the X. Now we're going to talk about the integral of cosine X and the integral of sine X. Now these go backwards because we want to remember that the derivative of cosine gave us negative sine and the derivative of sine gave us positive cosine. So if we're going to go backwards, right, then if we take the integral of cosine, we go back to positive sine. So the integral of cosine X is positive sine X and then plus C. And the integral of sine X, well, since, you know, I'm just doing the sine X part and I don't have the negative, we need to move the negative to the other side. So the integral of sine X gives us negative cosine of X plus C. And so later on, we'll talk about some of the other integrals, the other antiderivatives, but kind of the, the shortcut before was if we were taking the derivative of something that had C in it, then our answer, our derivative was negative. The shortcut here is when we're taking the integral, if it ends in C, like if our integral, the answer has a C in it, it's going to be negative. So it's kind of backwards, right? So going through this, if we wanted to figure out what is the integral of two sine of X plus cosine of X, we're just going to do them one at a time. So integral of two sine of X, right? Now the two is going to just kind of hang out. So it's going to be two times negative. Oops. The integral of sine of X is negative cosine of X. And the integral of cosine of x is going to be sine of x, and then plus c. 2 times a negative is negative 2, cosine of x, plus sine of x, plus c. And honestly, for most of you guys, I would actually just kind of jump straight to this step. And just kind of think, okay, the integral of sine is negative cosine, so it's going to be negative 2 cosine. Okay, this next one is kind of doing uh, both a polynomial and a sign. So the integral of t squared will become t cubed over 3. And then the integral of sine, right, is negative cosine, but I already have a negative. So it's going to like negative, negative cosine. So it's going to be plus cosine of t plus c. If you want to write it as one third, you can. One third t cubed plus cosine of t plus c. If you want to leave it as t cubed over 3, that works as well. Right, the next one has x's, right? And I do want to point out these terms had t in it and we had dt, but we do it the exact same way, right? Because we're taking it with respect to t. Basically, this variable just needs to match up with the variables inside. Okay, the integral of 4x, so it's 4 times x squared over 2 minus 3. Now, the integral of cosine we said was sine of x and plus c. We get 2x squared minus 3 sine of x oops, plus c. So we always need to remember that plus c. And some textbooks, instead of writing these separately, like I wrote 4 times x squared over 2, some textbooks you'll see kind of just put it together and put 4x squared over 2. That works as well. You'll get the same result. Okay, this last one, we do need to get it into polynomial form first. 
So I'm going to first write this as x to the 1 half plus sine of x. Add that parentheses dx. So now when we do our power rule, we're going to add 1. And I told you guys that the shortcut for that would be you're adding 2 over 2. So you're adding the denominator on. So that becomes x to the 3 halves. Now, don't write this part. I just want you to kind of see it. And then I'll show you what I write. Technically, it's x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. But I don't ever write divided by 3 halves because remember we said when we divide by a fraction, we, re we flip it. That's from like 8th grade math. We flip it and we multiply by the reciprocal. So I immediately know whenever I divide by a fraction, I just kind of go ahead and just multiply by the reciprocal. So x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves will give 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. Then the integral of sine, we said was negative cosine of x, and then plus c. So we'll get 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus cosine of x plus c. Now, if you wanted to write, you know, x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves first, if you wanted to write that, you can. But I just personally don't. I just personally kind of use that shortcut. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to do something that's a little bit trickier. And so this is, so far, all we've done is we've written plus c every time. Plus c, plus c, plus c. So now, what if we wanted to actually figure out what is that c? And so if we needed to figure that out, we would actually need to know about uh, we would need to know about some of these terms what are some of these terms so in this case this one's a little bit tricky but we know that basically the integral of f double prime of x dx is going to give us f prime of x plus c and so we want to look for the, the part where we have f double prime of x, right? This is we plugged in a number. This is we plugged in a number. So we can kind of say that the integral of 2 dx will end up being essentially 2x to the first power plus c. So we know now that f prime of x is going to be 2x plus c, right? Because Whatever this term is, right, whatever we get here, that's going to be our f prime of x, right? Because we took the integral of f double prime of x, so we're going to f prime of x. So we know f prime of x is 2x plus c. Well, we don't know what c is, but we can use this information here to kind of plug in and solve. So if we know just one point, we can figure out what was that c. So f prime of 2 will be 2 times 2 plus c. We said f prime of 2 is equal to 5. So 5 is equal to 4 plus c. Subtract 4 to both sides, we get 1 is equal to c. So this tells us now that we know that f prime of x is equal to 2x plus 1. That's our equation. It's 2x plus 1. Okay. So now we have an equation for f prime of x. Now we're going to do our same process, but with the integral of f prime of x. So the integral of essentially write the integral of f prime of x dx. That's going to go to f of x plus c. So if we take the integral of 2x plus 1, that was our f prime of x, right? Our answer is going to go to f of x. So the integral of 2x plus 1 is 2x squared over 2 plus x plus c. That's x squared plus x plus c. So that's going to be equal to f of x. So we know f of x is going to be x squared plus x plus c. Now we're going to use our information to figure out that c. So we can kind of put f of 2, or I'm going to just put 10, is equal to 2 squared plus 2 plus c. That gives us 10 is equal to 4 plus 2 is 6 plus c. Subtract 6, we get 4 equals c. So that means that f of x, the formula was x squared plus x plus c, we're going to plug in 4 for that c. So x squared plus x plus 4. Okay, if that got a little confusing for you, essentially what the process was is we started off with the term that had an x in it, right? We took the integral of that term, we got 2x plus c, then we know that the integral of an f double prime should be f prime, 
So we can say f prime of x equals 2x plus c. Then we plugged in 5 for our y value and 2 for our x value to solve for the c. So we did that process, we got 1 is equal to c. We take that 1 and we put it back into c, and now we have a formula for f prime of x. Then we just did that whole process again for f of x. So now the integral of f prime is going to go to f of x. So f of x was x squared plus x plus c. We plugged in 10 for the y value and 2 for the x value. So 10 equals 2 squared plus 2 plus c. We got 4 equal to c. And we just take that 4 and we plug it back into c. So x squared plus x plus 4. Okay. Uh, so we'll do that one more time just to kind of get the hang of it. So if we take the integral of x to the negative 3 halves dx, that gives us, if we add on 1, that gives us x to the negative 1 half. When we divide by negative 1 half, if you flip that, it's like multiplying by negative 2 over 1, and then plus c. So we can say that f prime of x is equal to negative 2x to the negative half plus c. So now we're going to plug in 2 for our y value and 4 for our x value plus c. We're trying to do no calculator on this guy. So what I'm going to do is kind of rewrite this as 4 to the 1 half power, right? And 1 half power is like a square root. So this is 2 equals negative 2 over 2 plus c. That gives us 2 equals negative 1 plus c. Add 1 to both sides and we get 3 is equal to c. So now what we can say is we had f prime of x equal to negative 2x to the negative half plus c. We can say f prime of x equals negative 2x to the negative half power plus 3. And if you really needed to, you know, on a, a multiple choice or something, just be aware that this would be negative 2 over square root of x plus 3, right? Bring the negative half down and change it to exponent form. Okay, but I'm going to leave my answer like that in polynomial form. Now we're going to take the integral of both sides again. So kind of the integral of negative 2x to the negative half power plus 3 dx, that's going to give us back f of x, right? So when we take the integral here, we have that negative 2. X, when we add on 1 half, right? Sorry, when we add 1, we're adding, the, we're adding 1 to the negative 1 half. So uh, when we add 1, we're kind of adding that denominator up to the numerator. So you get positive 1 half divided by 1 half, which we can say is like having 2 over 1. And then plus 3x plus c. So negative 2 times 2 gives us negative 4x to the 1 half plus 3x plus c. And we said that's going to be equal to f of x. Right, so f of x equals negative 4x to the half plus 3x plus c. And so now we're going to plug in f of 0 equals 0. So we plug in 0 equals any x to the 0 is going to be 0 plus 0 plus c. So we get 0 equals c. So there was no constant here. So when we rewrite this, we just write it without a constant. So negative 4x to the half. Again, if you want to change that to square root of x, you can. Plus 3x. And you don't have to write plus 0 because you know, in math, we don't really write that. So technically, it's plus 0, but we'll just end it there. All right. Uh, we do have one word, word problem example. And so this goes back into our, our thoughts of rates, right? We said the rate was a derivative. So when we see the word rate, we were thinking that the rate was a derivative. So, right, the rate was the derivative kind of of our original amount. So we can kind of say then that the integral of the rate with respect to time will give us back the original amount. Now, kind of plus C for right now, but we'll, we'll get into that. So we have an evergreen nursery, right? Like a, a plant, like nursery, a uh, plant store, usually sells a certain shrub after six years of growth and shaping. The growth rate during those six years is estimated by the function. So it says the growth rate. So we wanna make sure that we're kind of clear that this is the rate at which the plant grows.
Okay, where t is time and h is the height. So it's the rate that the height is changing. The seedlings are 12 centimeters tall when planted at time zero. That's important, right? Remember how they gave us in these last two? We were given like an f of two equals 10. So we can solve for that c. This is gonna help us solve for that c. So we know essentially they give us that h of zero is equal to 12. That's what they gave us. So find the value of the differential equation above using three. Now differential equation, that means the derivative. So they want us to figure out what is dh dt at time three, right? We're just plugging in three to t just to the you know, derivative. So 1.5 times three is 4.5, 4.5 plus five is 9.5. And they wanna have correct units of measure. So they said t was in centimeters and, sorry, uh, h was in centimeters, t was in years. So it's gonna be centimeters per year. And then using correct units, explain what this is. So we could say that the rate, the height of the plant is changing. is 9.5 centimeters per year at time equals three years. Okay, next find an equation for H. So we have dH dt equal to 1.5 t plus three, and we wanna go back to H. So kind of the way that I do this, honestly, is I'll just take the integral of both sides. So the integral of dh dt with respect to time and the integral of 1.5 t plus three with respect to time. So what is the integral of dh dt? That's like the integral of you know, y prime. It goes back to y. So this is h of t on that side. And on this side, we're gonna get 1.5 t squared over two plus three t plus c. And then we can plug in our initial value, which was 12 at time zero. So 12 is equal to 1.5 t squared when we plug in zero, zero plus zero plus c. So we get 12 equals to c. This is gonna give us h of t equals. Now, if we don't wanna have 1.5 uh, divided by two, right? We can just kind of think what is 1.5 divided by two, and we'll end up with, uh, 0.75 t squared plus 3t now instead of plus c plus 12. okay you also could have moved the decimal if we needed a fraction so just kind of reminder like if i have 1.5 over 2 you can move the decimal over so you'd get 15 over 20 and 15 over 20 could simplify, you divide by five, you would get three fourths. And that makes sense because three fourths is 0.75. So that could have been an answer as well, right? And it says, then determine how tall the shrubs are when they are sold. So when they were sold, let's go back to the problem. It said that they grow for six years before they sell them. So we wanna find H of six. How tall are they when they're sold? So 0 0.75 times 6 squared will give us 36, plus 3 times 6, plus 12. Okay, so 3 fourths times 36 gives us 27. Okay, and then 27 plus, oh uh, yeah, I did mess that up. Okay, I was looking at my work, I realized uh, I wrote a 3 in here. That should have been a five. So all of these threes, those all should have been fives. So hopefully you caught that. If you didn't, you can go ahead and change it now, like I am. So that was five, five T, five T, five T. This would be five times six. I was looking at my answer and I realized uh, I messed that up. So we said that's 27 plus 30. 
plus 12. 27 plus 30 is 57. And 57 plus 12 will give us 69. We need units, centimeters. A uh, couple more, just these are the last two to kind of practice. And that's that we've talked about position, velocity, and acceleration in the last chapter. And so you can kind of make yourself a little note that we'll go more into detail with this later. But we had always said, you know, the derivative of position is velocity. And the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So going backwards, the integral of acceleration will give us velocity, and the integral of velocity will give us position. So we want to kind of use that to our advantage. So we know that a particle moves at a velocity v of t equals 1 over square root of t, and at time 1 they're telling us the position is 4. So what is the acceleration of the particle? This is something we're familiar with. We've done this before. Right, going from, you know, essentially position, velocity, acceleration, kind of going down that chart or that ladder, right, we take the derivative. We've done this before. So if we want to go from velocity to acceleration, we take the derivative. I'm going to rewrite this in polynomial form as t to the negative one half power. So the derivative, right, v prime of t, that's going to give us a of t. And that's going to be negative one half t to the negative three halves. We don't need to add a plus c for derivatives. They don't get a plus c, right? The constants go away. I'll rewrite this as negative one over two t to the three halves, or we can even rewrite it as negative one over two square root of t cubed. So then from there, if we want to figure out what is the acceleration at time nine, a of nine, we're going to try to do this without a calculator, is negative one over two times the square root of nine cubed. Now, if you try to do this nine cubed first, it's going to get really to a big number, but you can always do the square root first. So this is negative one over two, the square root of nine is three, so times three cubed. Three cubed is 27. Right, 3 times 3 times 3, and 2 times 27 will give us 54. All right. Now, this one's going to be a little bit trickier, is what is the position? So again, if we have that ladder, I call this like the motion ladder, position, velocity, and acceleration. If we ever want to go up the ladder, we have to take the integral. So kind of what I write is, I write v of t equals to t to the negative 1 half power, and I take the integral of both sides, right, kind of dt and dt. So the integral of velocity will become acceleration. And when we do this integral, we add 1. So t to the half divided by half is like having 2 over 1. Right, when we divide by half, plus c. Uh, sorry, the integral of velocity is not a. The integral of velocity is position, is x of t. You could also write p of t. Right, so x of t is equal to 2 square root of t plus c. We don't know what that c is. But they told us at time 1, the position is 4. So we always use that initial condition to solve for our c. So at time 1, our position was 4. We subtract 2 to both sides, we get 2. And so then we can plug that back in up here. We get x of t equals 2 square root of t plus two, and then we could use that to figure out the position at any time, All right? So what is the position at time nine? So the position at time nine is two times the square root of nine plus c, sorry, plus two. The square root of nine is three, two times three is six, six plus two is eight, okay? so. That's how we do that. Now, kind of going back up here to these other two examples, I didn't show that the first time, but really it would have been a little bit better and easier and more clean to write that the way that I just did. So I do want to just quickly show that is when we had this f double prime of x equal to 2, it would have actually been a little bit cleaner to just write integral dx. And integral dx, and we could say the integral of f double prime 
is f prime of x. And then the integral of 2 would have been 2x plus c. And then to go ahead and like plug in, right, we plugged in, uh, I believe, 5 and 2. So 5 for the y, 2 for the x. So we got c equals 1. So we got f prime of x was now equal to 2x plus 1. And again, just keeping with that theme, it would have been cleaner to just say, let's take the integral of both sides. And the integral of f prime of x would be f of x. And so again, as 2x squared over 2 is x squared plus x plus c. And then to plug in, uh, it looks like it was 10 and 1, I think. Uh, no, 10 and 2. So plug in 10 and 2. And we get 4 equals to c. And so we have f of x equals x squared plus x plus 4. And we had f prime of x was 2x plus 1. Okay, another thing that you can do to kind of check these answers just a little bit is you can take the derivative and make sure that you get that. So what's the derivative x squared plus x? It's 2x plus 1. What's the derivative 2x plus 1? It's 2. And you can do that for all of these questions, right? For any of these antiderivative questions that we've boxed, you could take the derivative and you should get back the answer, right? The integral of 3x squared plus 2x plus 3. So if we take the derivative of x cubed, we get 3x squared. The derivative of x squared, 2x. The derivative of 3x, 3. So if you have time, you can go back and kind of plug these in. Now some of them are harder to plug in because like this one, when you take the derivative, uh, it's not factored yet. So you have to make sure that, you know, when you changed it into a polynomial, you didn't make any mistakes. But that is a way we can check our answers. So your homework over the weekend or with Mr. C, will be day 47 homework. And just kind of a reminder, right, some hints for number one, right, we wanna change that into polynomial form. So remember if we have cube root of x, like anything outside, right, we always did x to the inside power divided by the outside power. So the inside power goes on top, the outside power goes on bottom. So in this case, like, that's a one, so this will be x to the one third power plus three. We want to change that into polynomial form. On number three, you're going to want to make sure you distribute, get it into polynomial form. On number five, you're going to want to again change those to polynomial form. For the one half, remember the one half is going to stay in the denominator. So in this one, I'll kind of help us out is the x to the half stays there, but then the one half stays like that and you need to change that to x to the negative one half power. So it's a hint for number number five. On number six, we do that separation, right? So we divide every single term by x cubed, right? So like three x squared over x cubed minus two x over x cubed plus three over x cubed. Seven's a little bit tricky and eight is also a little bit tricky. We didn't do anything like that, but I'll kind of uh, help us out a little bit is this is gonna be the integral of y cubed times y to the half. Now, you cannot do these separately, right? Everything that we've done separately is because it had a plus sign. The plus is our separator. Multiplication is not a separator, right? When we had multiplication, we had to FOIL it. So here, we do have to multiply these two first before we can take the integral. So y cubed times y to the half. Remember, when we're multiplying exponents, we, or sorry, when we're multiplying, we add our exponents, right? Like x squared times x cubed is not x to the sixth, that's x to the fifth. We add our exponents. So three plus one half is three and a half, but we don't want to write mixed fractions, that's nasty. So we're gonna say three over one is six over two, so we're gonna get seven halves. So this is the integral of y to the seven halves power dy. This guy here will do kind of the same process. One over w to the first times w to the half dy. And from there, you can multiply them, but then you need to bring it up to make it a negative exponent. Okay, nine is similar again. I'll kind of start us off with nine. Is we're gonna do the integral x cubed over square root of x plus three over square root of x dx. And then here, x cubed over x to the half power, plus, I'm gonna just bring this one up to three x to the negative half, dx. 
And then instead of adding, when we divide, we subtract. So three minus one half, right? That six over two minus one half will give x to the five halves power. So that's going to be how to simplify this one. Okay, here we're gonna have to FOIL. First, you're gonna FOIL the squared, and then you'll FOIL that one. And then this is these two have cosine and sine in them. And 13 and 14 were that process where you know, we're gonna start off with f prime of x equals 2x minus sine of x. We're gonna take the integral with respect to dx to both sides, and then plug in our x and our y value. This one's the same process, but because it starts off with f double prime of x, we're gonna to have to do the integral twice. So we're gonna end up with that. And we'll have to do it twice. Okay, and then that's it for this uh, homework. Now, I do wanna make one more point before you go and do the homework, is I really want this homework to be non-calculator. Okay, so do your best to use no calculator here. Uh, this should be a homework that we do all by hand. It's good practice for us to do it all by hand. We're gonna be expected to do half of the AP exam by hand, and all of these questions are ones that they might ask us without a calculator. So we will learn how to take antiderivatives, the integrals on our calculator, but for right now, I don't want you to try to do that. If you figure it out, that's great but I want you to do these all by hand.